Hello and welcome to the Swine Disease Reporting System. This is the report number 64, where we're going to cover data up to May 2023 here at the Swine Disease Reporting System. My name is Edison Magalhães here at SDRS Studio. Hello, my name is Giovanni Trevis, I'm the Swine Disease Reporting System. Hi, my name is Guilherme, also at the SDRS Studio. And today we're going to cover the SDRS findings, as I mentioned, up to May 2023. But also we have the pleasure to have here today uh, Dr. Pablo Pinheiro, which is an associated professor here and diagnostician here at Iowa State University. So he'll be joining us today here at the SDRS podcast. Dr. Pinheiro earned her, uh, his veterinary degree from the Universidad de la Plata in Argentina and has two PhD degrees, one from Universidad de la Plata in veterinary pathology and epidemiology, and one from Virginia Tech in veterinary science. Dr. Pinheiro has worked with several swine pathogens, including porcine sarcovirus, uh, which will be our program focus here today in this podcast. Dr. Pinheiro, thanks for accepting our invitation and welcome to the SDRS podcast. Thank you so much, Edison, for such a kind introduction. Uh, pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I'm a big fan of the podcast, so an honor to be with you guys. Our pleasure to having you, Dr. Pinheiro. Yeah, thank you. Guilherme. Why don't you go ahead and talk about what was defined from the month of May? Yes, let's start about the first page, as always, for the PERS virus, that there is no much variation in the percentage of post submissions from PERS since the beginning of the year. Uh, we are having an overall percentage of post submissions around 26%, and the win to market category around 35%. What we had a little bit different in this month was the cell farm that had a moderate decrease in the percentage of post submissions. However, when we look to the sequencing part, the L1C variant strain is still having detection in the eastern states, with more detections coming from Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And Ohio specifically is a little bit concerned because three from of these four detections came from cell farms. So we still have some activity there going on of PERS virus at regional level. How about the entire coronavirus, influenza? Uh, just a, a, a little comment, Giovanni, about the, the advisory group that they reported that even though we have this good scenario of PERS in terms of detection, they are seeing the field as well that is a good year in terms of managing outbreaks, but they still have a reasonable number of cell farms that are positive and they are producing positive piglets. So we might have changes in detection the winter market in the next months. Nice. And, oh, sorry. How about the other pathogens? Yeah, moving to the enteric coronavirus, the Delta coronavirus had a moderate decrease in the percentage of post submissions in all the age categories, but the percentage of post submissions is still above the expected for this period of the year in May. And regarding PED, is we've been inspected as since since the beginning of the year, since January, but now at the regional level, we can see uh, activity above expected in North Carolina, Missouri, Nebraska, and South Dakota. Anything for influenza? Yeah, from the influenza part, uh, we are having an increased detection of positive submissions in all the age categories. But the difference between like 2023, let's say, and the past two years is that percentage of positive starts to increase right now in the late spring and beginning of the summer. And just to do a comparison, in 2021, we had that in the mid-spring, and 2022 was an atypical year that we didn't have this uh, increase in influenza detection in the, in the beginning and mid of the spring. How about PCV2? What are you bringing new this month to the report, and how is the detection of this agent? Yeah, for PCV2, we have some news for this month that we had two new charts in our report that we are able right now to keep track of the CT values, the average CT values of the submissions in a, within a month for PCV2 for specific sample types and also for specific regions of the US that we split it. So just to give some considerations about these two new charts, this was a request from our stakeholders that for then only keeping track of the number of positive cases and also the percentage of positive submissions by age category was not enough in terms of see the PCV2 detection in the field. And when we ran to them this information that we could add the CT values, they agreed that would be a good information for them to see if we are having not only an increase in percentage of positive cases, but also a drop in the average CT of all these submissions. So this, these two new charts that we have, we use the approach of 
establish a, a specific threshold, a baseline that would be like 22 uh, based on our calculation that we did running some statistical models to see that below 22, the CT, if the average, sub, if the average CT goes below that, we will have a high risk to have lesions of PCV2s so, uh, uh, PCV2 associated with these specific submissions. So we create a chart adding the first one on the left hand of your report when you open the PDF file. It's gonna have the sample type, oral fluid, processing fluid, tissue samples, uh, tissue submissions, uh, submissions that didn't have tissue and the overall submissions. And you can see the average CT values of all of them within a month. And the next chart is gonna, you can look at these, these tissue samples that we have in a regional level. So you can look to your specific region that the vet or the producer are working at, and you can see if we have any change in the terms of CT values for the PCV2 submissions coming from this specific region. Great, so basically you just remind that you went back there and looked with the working group, the advisory group from the SDRS to build this information. Now you're not only bringing on detection, but you did a milestone ahead to look for the CT values. Correct. We just need to put together a bonus page and invite everybody to look into that and reach oh, yeah. out if you have any questions. Oh yeah, it's gonna be the last page of the report. You can look at it to have more information about how we did the approach to establish all and to create all these charts. And as Dr. Travis mentioned, we had like the the input from the advisory group to create all of them as well. And in terms of the detection of PCV2, moving right now to what happened specifically with this pathogen. We have an increased detection in the percentage of win to market category. And now we are able to see not only this increased detection, but the association of all the regions from the US, we had a drop in the average CT value from the submissions. So it's not only an increased percentage of detection, but also lower CT values coming from PCV2 submissions. Very good. Thanks guys for, for bringing uh, this, this summary of what's happening. Uh, the, the, the SDIS data has shown uh, for the previous month. Uh, so now let's start our discussion specifically here with Dr. Pinheiro. Uh, so Dr. Pinheiro, the SDIS statistical uh, analysis for these new PCV2 charts, like Guilherme just mentioned, so these new data, uh, these new charts <laughs> we have here, and also having the input from, from the advisory group to, to uh, on, in terms of ideas on, to build them. So these charts, they use the PCV2 confirmed disease diagnosis uh, cases. Could you explain us, uh, to us uh, what is the definition or criteria for a PCV2 confirmed diagnosis? That's a really good question, Edison, because as Guillermo mentioned, so we are looking into those differentiation with different CT values to really take an action. And <clears throat> When we look into the case definition back in the day, prior vaccine, even it was a really easy, simple. Uh, we have the, the clinical manifestation, waist peaks, pale peaks, uh, large lymph nodes, dyspnea, uh, no response to antibiotic treatment. So that was easy. Then we follow up with uh, gross evaluation, presence of the lesions, uh, and we confirm those lesions histologically. So institutional pneumonia, institutional nephritis, granulomatous lymphadenitis. And finally, the, the last piece that we need is the confirmation of the pathogen within the lesion, which we normally traditionally did by immunostochemistry. So <clears throat> those were the three main steps and was really easy. The problem and the um, advantage is the new tools that we have, the PCR. So now everything the pathogen detection is based on PCR and that's the really sensible technique that can detect everything. Uh, we have to remember this is an endemic pathogen. It's gonna be everywhere. And this PCR can detect a really low amount. So the question is, is that detection, the response is the cause of a clinical presentation of the lesions associated with PCBAD. I think that we need to still have to make that correlation of the PCR values and the presence of these three things, the clinical presentation, the, the lesions, the gross and the histological lesions and the presence of the pathogen. Perhaps one of the limitations is now with the vaccine in the field, the clinical presentation is not that evident as it used to be. We have a small pockets here and there, animals breaking, but we don't have that massive 80% of animals that have been uh, manifesting clinical disease. That's one of the limitations. It's, it's a good thing because of the vaccine. The other one, the vaccine can reduce viremia but doesn't eliminate the viremia totally. 
So it's another thing. We're going to run a PCR and it's going to still positive. When that PCR correlates with the clinical presentation or, or, or presence of the lesions or detection of the pathogen. We've been doing some studies and we sh we've seen that th this value <clears throat> in animals with lesions and positive AHC goes into the 24, 25. So really close what Guilherme presented. It was a 22 based on the, on the, on the case report. Mm -hmm. So I think that those things need to be taken in consideration. PCR, if we're going to use that tool, need to be supported to confirm the PCVID, need to be supported by the three step uh, clinical, gross histological lesions, and detection of the pathogen. Perfect. Dr. Pinner is still talking about uh, PCV2 cases, but what we are having here from all the videos is an increased uh, percentage of submissions that are coming with processing fluid. Like mm -hmm. most of the veterinarians are submitting processing <laughs> fluids, and like in 2023, uh, over 58% of the submissions so far until um, May are processing fluid submissions. So what are some tips, like what are the advice to do the interpretation of these processing fluids? Like if I have a positive processing fluid and if I'm, if I'm monitoring, what does it mean if I have a drop in CT values or if I still have positive cases in my farm in processing, using processing fluids? So that's a, that's a really complicated uh question to, to answer, really, because it's an endemic virus that can be transmitted horizontally and vertically. So when you're looking into the first week of age on those piglets, so what you're looking at is a transmission basically from the south. So here we are looking at two things. What is the immune status of the south? If the south is well protected, perhaps the virus sharing is lower. If it's not well protected, the virus sharing could be higher. That would be directly related into those processing fluids. So we all know that vaccination status in the South herd might vary. You will have farms that never seen a vaccine, farms that seen a vaccine once a week, uh, once a year, and farms that get a vaccine twice a year. So the immunological status of the South herd is all over the place. So to have a consistent result in the processing fluid is really complicated. Now is the second part, what that processing fluid means in the downstream production. So if we don't have a really good uh, maternal immunity, most likely those animals are not gonna be clinically protected. So if our viral load is low and we have a low immunological status, so chances are that those are the ones that are gonna break. If those animals have a, a strong immune uh, protection from the dams, so the immune response will help to prevent that window after weaning to eight weeks of age. So. What I show you here is two scenarios that the processing fluid by itself, it may not explain everything to predict what's gonna happen in the growth initial phase. We need to have one more piece of information, which is what is the immune status of the south herd uh, that those processing fluids are coming from. In, in terms of this decrease, uh, Dr. Pinero, if we have like, for, for example, a certain stability, but it starts to decrease the CT values of processing fluids, should we consider doing a kind of whole herd vaccination or something to like kind of stabilize the immune status of the whole herd? I, I think so. I mean, perhaps the, the best thing to do here is to really go and evaluate the immune status of cells. Okay. So do, do a serological evaluation, IFA, virus neutralization assay to see where our cells are and then uh, put that, that, that management in place. So think about this, those, for example, I, I think in three categories within the south herd, the guilt, which are pretty much all of them well vaccinated, two, three shots before they get into the, the breeding program, the P2P5, which is they still protect them with this first immunity. And then what happened with the P5, P5 and above? The South may never saw a vaccine in the last three years. So you, you have different immune status and that will create pockets of, of um, susceptibility for the clinical presentation. So that's the thing that I don't know if we are taking in consideration that the South herd is not homogeneous. We have different levels and that will impact our South, our grower uh, production system. Well, that, that's a good comment. And if we look for that immunological stats, you have been working a lot on that. We have commercial vaccines that are available for PCB2, but we have been receiving reports recently of a uh, situation where you have this PCV2 associated disease there. And in which situations do you think a vaccinate herd could present with a, a PCV2 associated disease in downstream flow? 
So there is always a question about compliance. And unfortunately, we don't have a marker for compliance for PCV2. So that question is always going to be hanging there. How do we know if the sows or the piglets were well vaccinated? So mm -hmm. that question is always going to be there. Uh, and most because it's an endemic virus, we will run an ELISA, and they may be positive. The, the, the level of positivity depends on the vaccine on depend on the natural exposure. So that's, that question is there. But then, uh, the other question that we have for years is, you know, this shift that has been over the years in subtype from A to B to B to D. So it might have some sort of uh, tool in the immunological response. So we know uh, most of our commercial vaccines are A or AV. So the question always goes, you go and look at the structure of the virus and there's some difference. And my, my point always is, is not how how much is the difference in the genomic sequence is mostly where those differences are located. It could be a small difference, but if it is located in an immunodominant region, it could have an impact. And we start looking into that. Um, what we did is measure neutralizing antibodies on animals that were vaccinated with A, and we did the test with A and D. And we see difference in levels of neutralizing antibodies. Is that reflected in, in the animals? We don't know that yet. But we can tell that at antibody levels, animals that are vaccinated with A have 100% protection with, against A. And when you look into D, it has 40, 60. And vice versa, when you vaccinate animals with D and you do the test with, against D, have 100% neutralization. And when you do the test against A, you have 60% neutralization. If that number is translated to a real scenario, well, you have 40% of the animals that are not protected. I'm not saying that that is the real is what is happening when it, uh, when when we measure this in the live animal because we haven't done that yet. But in vitro is what is showing that there is this heterologous protection. Let's call it that way. Thank you for bringing us up to speed. Uh, it's very interesting your comment here that looks like the genotype those matter for vaccination decision there. Then it, it, it looked like the information that we have so far. It looked like, and we need to do further study, of course. To to confirm it and make this information more solid, but so far it's, it's going that way, it's going toward that way. So kind of in summary, Dr. Pinheiro will be considering like three things, the compliance, you can use the genotyping to understand what you just mentioned, and also this concept of having these pockets of different parity within the herd, so different immune. So considering those three when before you're trying to take any conclusions and Maybe use that all the three the three information to do to trigger a better investigation or understand better the immunological status of the herd or or the genotyping as you mentioned as a, as a tool. Is that be a correct interpretation? Like, yeah, I, I think that those perhaps should be the three start points to to look into when you have those PCVAD breaks in vaccinated farms, as you mentioned. We are having a clinical problem, and we're supposedly doing everything right. So what is failing? Okay, I think that. To start, maybe those would be the three main points to look into to start uh, uh, improving the response against the vaccine. Thanks for sharing that with us. No, a pleasure, a pleasure. So that was it, guys, for today. Thanks. It was very good discussion. Thanks for bringing all this update. Thanks, Guilherme, for also for the SDRS updates. And again, I encourage you guys, the audience, to check the bonus page, that new information that Guilherme uh, and the advisor group and everybody else here in the team prepared. So new charts, so new tools and new application for you guys in the field. Thanks, and see you guys next month. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you much. Thank you.